It's two o'clock. We're going to start this afternoon. This is our annual meeting. Uh, my name is Ernesto Portillo. I'm the public information officer for the Tucson City Department of Housing and Community Development. And uh, staff with uh, housing staff is with us, as well as public housing staff. And the purpose of the meeting this afternoon is to discuss the strategies and the goals and objectives of the housing choice voucher program, otherwise known as Section 8, and, and public housing programs. The draft 2022 Public Housing Authority plan, annual plan, and the five-year capital fund program action plan um, are available for public review, and I'll put a link in the chat box. If you don't have access uh, to the chat box, I will also put my, uh, I'll give you my phone number at the end of the program at the end of the meeting, as well as my email address, and you can contact me directly. Para aquellas personas que hablan español, me pueden llamar directamente. Yo luego les voy a dar mi número de teléfono para, para, que me, para que me hablen y yo puedo avisarles de este programa. If you are Spanish speaking, um, uh, I will give you my phone number later and you can contact me directly. I'd like to turn this over now to Terry Galligan, the Deputy Director uh, for uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Terry Galligan. I'm the Deputy Director here at the City of Tucson, and I oversee um, our public housing and our Section 8 visions. Um, so I just wanted to do a, a welcome. And right now, I'd like to turn it over to Liz Morales, our Director, to do a more formal introduction and let you know what our agenda is going to be. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us either on your computers, on your smartphones, or on your regular good old fashioned telephone. Uh, this is definitely uh, the, the way since we've had the pandemic to do public meetings. And we wish we could be in person, but again, we appreciate that you would take time out of your day um, to hear about our, our agency plan or, um, and the updates and all the other parts about our program. I'm going to share my screen. If you're just on the phone and you can't see it, um, we'll try to make sure we speak very clearly so you know what we're covering. Um, <clears throat> even if you can't see the video. So I'm about to share my screen. If you just give me a second. So let me open that up. Um, Ernesto, can you see that? Can you confirm you can see that? Yeah, okay. Yes, it's on Liz. Great. So this will be our guide of uh, talking about what our the purpose today is. Why are you here? Why are you listening to this? Um, every year, our uh, every housing authority that gets public housing or housing choice voucher section eight funding, we are required to do uh, a five year plan, which was done in 2020. And every year thereafter, for those five years, we have to do an annual update. Um, it is to inform our residents, the public, our mayor and council, who is our board of commissioners, and also HUD as to what we, what we have said we're going to do, how are we doing, and what new things we're going to do. The most important part of this process that is required of us is to make sure we get resident input. Um, 
because the work that we do directly impacts those who are either in our housing units as tenants or are um, are living in a in a property that with a housing choice voucher. So your input is really important. These sometimes are not easy things to explain, but we're going to try. So if we don't do a good job or there's new questions that you have, we will ask you to write those down. And at the end, we're going to open it up for questions and hopefully we can answer. If we can't answer today, we will get back to you. But please definitely track your questions so you don't lose track of them. And, and if there's general comments or questions you want to put into writing and you don't want to necessarily talk on this forum, we do have an email address we'll share at the end, um, encouraging you to say whatever you want to say about the agency plan and the, the things that we discussed today. So with that, I'm going to, um, this will give you a chance to also meet our team. You, you already met Ernesto, who's our public information officer, our deputy director, Terry Galligan. Now you get to meet Norma uh, Peterson, who is our, uh, one of our housing managers in the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. So I'll turn it over to Norma. Thank you, Liz. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for being here with us today. Um, I'm going to be go, going over understanding the plan, and the plan includes changes or updates uh, to housing authority policies, such as how residents are admitted, how rents are determined and collected, our grievance procedures and eviction, resident programs and services, such as home ownership, community service, and self-sufficiency, safety and crime prevention, budgets for maintenance, repairs, security, and other programs. The documents also describe any new activities that the Housing Authority will undertake, such as development and redevelopment projects, changes to housing subsidies and programs, including converting public housing to RAD, modernizations, as well as the designation of housing for specific populations such as the elderly. Now we're going to ask Cindy, um, who is also one of our managers in our Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, to cover this next slide. Hi, good afternoon. Um, the overview for Tucson and Pima. So the Housing Authority or the Public Housing and Community Development Department does administer um, vouchers for both Tucson and Pima County. We currently have 4,798 vouchers for the um, city of Tucson and 877 vouchers for Pima County. We also have public housing, 1,505 units. So the, this next um, out, uh, slide is around, so just to explain, as we submit to HUD, there's a format in which we have to submit all our updates. The next section is really about the initial plan and what we said we would do and what changes we've made to those. So what we're going to share in the next few slides is not does not include everything we said in the five year plan. It just speaks to the changes we've made to those parts of the five year plan that is different. So these are changes that we will have starting uh, July 1 of 2022. And I'm going to ask Terry to cover um, the housing needs? Well, I'm sure that anyone and everyone on this call has heard about the affordable housing crisis in Tucson. Um, we have some places that have raised their rent by up to 40%. Um, so a lot of our uh, voucher holders and the community as a whole um, is struggling to find housing and we uh, recognize that in our department, housing and community development, and we have a, 
a plan that's called the Housing Affordability Strategy for Tucson. And it's an important plan that we think that uh, you should go and check out. Uh, there's a, a link here and I'll, I'll ask Ernesto um, to uh, put that in our on the chat also for some of you that are on your phone or check back. But we, we recognize that this is probably one of the most difficult markets um, in many, many years in Tucson. And so we're trying to adjust our programs and our, our procedures and our goals. So I'll, I'll let, um, you know, we'll proceed on to see how we're doing that, how we're spending our money. And I'll go on to the next slide, please. And I believe that uh, Cindy was gonna talk a little bit about this, is that correct? You're on mute, Liz. My apologies. So I, I think it's important. One of the things HUD wants to know is what is our current budgets for our federal grants? And so just to explain to all of you, our public housing, the, the housing that we own and operate as landlords, we get three different funding sources. One is the operating subsidy from HUD, which is about 1.9 million. We also get a capital fund, which is about 2.5 million, um, which helps, uh, we'll, we'll be talking more about what kind of repairs and updates we do to our housing. We also get tenant revenue, which is not a federal grant, um, but you can see it under un other sources, the, the rental income um, and other charges and miscellaneous income. On the housing choice voucher program, we get two funding, uh, from two different funding uh, pots from HUD. One is for the housing assistance payments, the rent that we pay to landlords, and the other is the administrative fee. That's what HUD gives us to do the operations. So that pays for staffing, utilities, um, supplies, all the things that we need to operate the program. We also have a ROS grant that stands for uh, for resident services. So we have a resident services coordinator um, at some of our public housing. Um, and and as, as I mentioned, the capital fund um, is unobligated under the prior year. Those are funds that still carried over and we're still spending those. Um, and then under home and CDBG, we do get a little bit of funding from those federal grants that are also from HUD which provides some rental assistance and security and utility deposits. And we've used CDBG to help us with improvements uh, on the elevators for Tucson House. So that's just an overview. Again, we have to report that as to what all the sources of funds that we get from the federal government um, to help operate these programs. Next, um, it's Cindy and Selene will talk about how rent is determined. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Selena Tibbetts and I am the Community Services Manager for the Public Housing Division. And I'm gonna be talking about the public housing flat rents. Uh, so the flat rents are determined um, every year. Uh, there's a study that is done on the comparables of the area. And also HUD publishes a fair market rent table and this year we have decided to uh, use the 80% of the FMR to determine our rents, our flat rents, which means that the rent, the flat rents are not increasing. Um, and this is based on, uh, you know, the current situation with COVID and rentals and things like that of the increase. So at this point, our flat rents, um, you know, have not increased from last year for public housing. The minimum rents for both public housing and Section 8 are at zero. And this year for the payment standards, we are using 120% of the fair market rent of, for calendar year uh, 2022. Um, and that was effective on uh, March 9th. We increased our payment standards to 120% of the fair market rent. Um, 
I believe, Selena, will you cover the changes in operations and management? Yes. So the rules, standards, and policies, um, as far as the office hours, uh, they are Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. Uh, we do have uh, walk-ins, and as of Monday, April 4th, we will accept all walk-ins between those hours. Um, at each of the AMP offices, also too, as far as the um, after hours maintenance, uh, we did have a phone number change this last year. So if you wanna make note of that, um, the new after hours maintenance uh, phone number for public housing is 520-237-1240. And we'll also put that in the chat. Um, also too, as far as uh, management, um, for the preventive services uh, or eradication of pest infestation for public housing, this is done uh, and performed free of charge initiated by the resident if they feel that there is an infestation. We do have some of our high rise properties that are already on a regular routine pest control. Um, we also have our lease that is dated in 2018, that also has all the rules and the standards and policies for our public housing. Uh, we recently on the public housing, as far as policies, we recently incorporated um, some changes and you'll notice those later on in the, what we call the ACOP. And that'll explain a little bit more about some changes that are coming up on the work order side. Programs in housing. One of the programs in housing is the Connect Homes. Uh, so the Connect Homes is a program that was developed in, uh, it started as a pilot and it is a pilot over at Tucson House and it's to uh, intertwine the, kind of the community with uh, internet services. So we're hoping that that will expand out to the rest of the program in the near future. As far as the community services, um, so that was basically placed on hold um, due to COVID and the pandemic. And we're just waiting for an update with, from HUD that will come out probably sometime in April that will determine if it would be still on hold or if it will be lifted. Uh, our self-sufficiency programs, Uh, with um, our the FSS, which also um, we will continue doing uh, and during this next year, and safety and crime prevention grant. We've also started that um, in the Choice Neighborhood area, and we've continued that uh, as well as incorporating with the Tucson House and other uh, public housing. Uh, units in that same choice neighborhood area. Uh, going on to choice neighborhoods, uh, choice neighborhood is a planning grant uh, in 2018 and was recently um, completed and we have now um, selected a co-developer, which is a partner to redevelop the Tucson house in the next fiscal year. Uh, the city of Tucson will work with the co-developer to create a phase plan for the financing, construction, relocation, and replacement of the units. Um, the agency will assess the feasibility of a successful implementation grant application during the next fiscal year to address the needs of the Tucson house and the surrounding area, which includes 408 of its units. Uh, the agency does anticipate um, approval of the Choice Neighborhood Transformation Plan in February or March of this year. 
and the plan details a vision for redeveloping the Tucson House along with the goals and strategies to improve uh, the neighborhood and surrounding neighborhood within the choice uh, boundaries. Uh, the action activities approved through the planning grant will be implemented and installed in the next fiscal year. And moving on to the fixed finance modernization. Uh, so just recently we had a physical needs assessment that was completed in 2021 for all of the uh, public housing units. And uh, based on that, we will be looking at developing an asset re repositioning plan. Uh, so our table, our timetable with that to go to the Board of Commissioners is gonna be next year of June of next year, 2023. Uh, demolition and disposition. The City of Tucson uh, HED will be considering demolition and or disposition as a result of the recent physical needs assessment that was performed in 2021. Um, along with that, that's also gonna be in the asset repositioning plan, which we will be presenting to the Board of Commissioners next June of 2023. Uh, we also have a uh, designated housing for elderly and disabled families. Uh, so our department will be working to complete a designated housing plan uh, for a couple of our uh, sites, which is Land Gardens, MLK, Silver Bell. Um, and that plan will basically be requesting to HUD to designate these three properties as elderly and or disabled. They are currently all under the general occupancy. So that also will be happening this next uh, fiscal year. And the uh, conversation in reference to the RAD. So RAD is the rental assistance demonstration and it's the conversion of the public housing units uh, to go either RAD, PBRA or PPD. Uh, and this is, actually based on the physical needs assessment that took place this last year as well. Um, <clears throat> so once we have the asset repositioning plan that will be presented next year in June to determine what, which, which way we're gonna be taking as far as with our, um, with our assets. All right, you, I think you're done, right, Solana? I have one more, uh, just the approved vacancies for modernization. Uh, so what that means is under public housing, we have approved vacancies for modernization under HUD. And this is what we call offline units. And they're approved units, which means that they are not, uh, we still receive subsidy for them, but we have to initiate requests of offline units. Um, and currently we have um, five units that are offline. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Selene. So the next uh, update is from uh, our progress around the five-year plan. So we just finished talking about changes um, now we're going to talk about things that we've accomplished as a result of um, the work we've done in the past year. So this is the part where we get to um, celebrate and even talk about maybe some challenges, which we've had both. So I'm going to ask um, Cindy to talk about increased affordable housing. Selene is going to talk about improved quality of housing. And Norma is going to talk about promoting self-sufficiency. Okay, so increasing um, the affordable housing. Um, we, the city of Tucson, have utilized the CARES Act and American Rescue Funds to assist with deposits um, for participants to increase the number of landlords. We've done eviction prevention and um, a landlord incentive program. Um, during last year, we spent over um, 350,000 in these um, programs. 
um, decrease homelessness. We've increased the number of um, HPP vouchers from 598 to 1,000. Um, this allows the city of Tucson and Pima County to house more homeless persons during the pandemic to reduce the spread. We've also hired some housing navigators and the vacancy rate for units has decreased to 3% for the fiscal year and the public housing program continue to turn units timely. I'm sorry, Selena, I'm, I'm going into your stuff. Um, we also have the project-based voucher program for both Tucson and Pima County. Um, it is a great program and we are incre increasing affordability by offering project-based vouchers. Um, we had four projects, 41 units open and lease up since July of 2021. Um, three projects entered into an AHAP contract and one conditional award, which will bring an additional 111 units to Tucson and Pima County communities. Um, the PHA continues to review the effectiveness of the software and, and completed an upgrade, which allows for the following, online recertifications, online work orders, and a procurement module, modular. With a software upgrade, the city of Tucson will open the city of Tucson and Pima County HCV wait list and certain amps for public housing before December 31st of 2022. So I'll be speaking on improving the quality of assisted housing. So the city of Tucson housing um, uses housing navigators has demonstrated to be a needed assistance to HCV voucher holders that have been on vouchers for an extended period of time or are hard to house as a result of the difficulty to secure units. So basically these navigators were hired to help people find places to live in, to rentals, rentals, finding landlords who are renting uh, currently. Um, as a result, the navigators assisted 63 families since October 1st of 2021 to January 26th of this year, with 31 households existing to per exiting to permanent and supportive housing destinations. Also, a temporary navigator was assigned to the landlord support team to assist HCV voucher holders in obtaining permanent housing, utilizing their voucher for housing. Um, so the PHA received the physical needs assessment and an energy audit from consultants AEI on the public housing portfolio. And it was determined that the capital needs over the next 20 years are estimated at $16 million. Uh, based on this information, HED will present to the board of commissioners a plan on addressing the capital needs uh, to convert to other HUD and mixed family tools. And those are the ones that we talked about previously, possibly RAD, PVV, uh, PV, and um, housing choice vouchers. Modernization and renovation efforts did not move forward based on the virus and limited staffing available based on the virus. However, this will be a priority in the next year. So many of our contractors and because of the virus, the COVID, it delayed a lot of the um, renovations that we were planning for many of our units um, <clears throat> based on supply and the work, work demand. We also added a supervisor for the housing quality standards team and two new inspectors to provide more timely inspections and ensure units are safe and decent for program participants. And I think Norma, you'll be talking about the self-sufficiency. Yes, thank you, Selena. Uh, so the city of Tucson has been involved in several initiatives to promote self-sufficiency. 
Um, and in case you didn't know, the city of Tucson is a current recipient of a National League of Cities Equitable Economic Mobility Initiative grant. The city is using this opportunity to design, implement, and coordinate financial wellness, as well as economic stability programming at the Tucson House. As a Connect Home USA participant through HUD, the PHA is also coordinating increased access to affordable internet services, devices, and digital, digital literacy training among public housing residents, including a partnership with the Pima County Public Library to provide a customized curriculum for those who received a free tablet with the T-Mobile service. Uh, case management and health screening referral services are being offered to Tucson Housing resident, excuse me, Tucson House residents by two partner agencies, Compass Affordable Housing and the Arizona State University Office of Community Engagement and Resiliency. All right, thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, our next um, pre presenter on, and Renee uh, is going to introduce himself and he's going to talk a little bit our, about our capital fund program. So go ahead, Renee. Good afternoon. My name is Renee Arrieta. I'm the program, program coordinator for the capital fund program. As Liz, Liz touched on it before we get approximately uh, $2.5 million in it. It tends to go up a little bit every year, but part of the program, we set up a five-year plan. Basically, it's like a wish list of things we we propose to do in the coming five years. And um, in 2022, uh, we some of the items, basically these aren't, aren't necessarily repair items. They're major, major re replacement. It's not something that, that we're repairing or something we want to replace and bring it back to like a new standard. So what we're, one of the main things we're doing is replacing roofs on all our properties. And like we, you heard before, it's approximately 1500 units and they're scattered sites. So that makes it kind of difficult to maintain. So we're working on roofs. We're working on site development, exterior lighting, uh, repairing parking lots. Uh, as Selena mentioned, uh, Modernization basically means we go in and rehab uh, older units. Uh, that includes a total rehab of all the, all the items inside the house. So that's another category that we are, we schedule in that five-year plan as, and identifying units that need modernization. Um, the other thing we do is replacing evaporative coolers with uh, air conditioning uh, to help make uh, tenants more comfortable and at the same time it eventually helps reduce the energy cost and ha has a lot less maintenance involved. So, and then the other, one of the other major items is water heaters or one of our projects uh, that are older, we start replacing those before they go bad. So basically it's the main things uh, along with emergency that might come up during any current year and if an emergency arises during any grant year, uh, we have the ability to add it to the five-year plan uh, because it is an emergency. So it's pretty flexible. It's always volatile. Uh, the money's the, the money goes where it's needed the most, and uh, and that's that's what the five-year plan's about. And and hopefully uh, that helps explain it. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me anything. If not, um, I'm done. Thank you, Renee. You did a great job uh, explaining that. Um, we Again, I, I've already seen some good questions in the chat function. So that's another good place if you want to put your questions there when we get, we're co getting close to the end. Um, but we please remember to add any questions you have there or hold on to them until we open up that time. Um, one of the things I want to share is that Besides the annual agency plan that we have to report to HUD, 
every year we update our policy documents. So because there's two programs that we've been talking about today, the public housing, which is the 1500 units that we own and operate as, as landlords. And then we also have the section eight housing choice voucher program when uh, we have an administrative plan, which HUD requires that we list our policies. Um, and so, and for public housing, it's called the admissions and continued occupancy plan. Um, it's the plan for public housing. So both these documents have to be updated every year. This year we made uh, some changes that uh, to make sure we're staying current to what we know are the needs and the issues. Um, I'd like to quickly share with you um, what some of those changes look like. So let me share what that looks like. So here is an, um, one of the documents, and I'll tell you how you can find the, the documents if you want to read them in your own time and, and try to understand what they mean. Some of it is a, more around HUD technical language. So I know we've been doing that a lot today. It's hard for us to get out of that mindset. But this is an example of the changes we've made on the public housing side. Um, as you can see here, this one talks about non-discrimination and, um, and then how we improve access for persons with limited English proficiency um, around eligibility. And some of these things, you, most of our clients or tenants don't understand. These are things we have to ensure we're doing either by what HUD tells us or what our board of commissioners, which is mayor and council, we also talk about selection method. How do we select people off the wait list? Um, I know that's always a question I get often is about our wait list. When are you gonna open? I will tell you that on the public housing side, we have several of our sites that need to open the wait list. And we hope to do that in the next few months. Um, I'm thinking shooting for sooner, but it might be as early as June or July might be, a, uh, we're working with our software vendor to help us get that open. But this, uh, our ACOP talks about how do we select people off the wait list, leasing and inspections, uh, making sure we're providing um, language uh, resources for people who have multiple languages, inspection results, how do we handle that? And then grievance and appeals, everyone that's in our program has a right to grieve or appeal, depending on what it is. Um, our change here is talking about if we do it remotely, like in this type of setting where it's on a, on a Zoom meeting or some other way in which we might be able to do a, an informal hearing. And then we changed the fact that Lander Gardens, which is one of our properties, now has air conditioning instead of uh, a, a different source. I, I don't know if it was a lot of, uh, um, I can't think of the word, but we, we changed it to air conditioning. So that's a positive thing. So that shows you the policy changes to the admissions continued occupancy. Uh, the housing choice voucher has a few more. So we won't go through um, all the changes on that one. Let me see where it's at. Okay, here's the one for the voucher program, section eight. So there's a lot of and a lot of this is very minor changes, but we have to update it. So um, as an example, some of this is related to HUD systems, when we do briefings for new participants. And this one will take you a lot longer to read, doing remote video inspections, adding a chapter on the new program called emergency housing choice vouchers, emergency housing vouchers. That's a new program. We put that into the chapter that we got that funding from HUD this past year. It really is to serve people who are homeless or coming out of domestic violence. Um, talking about our hearings, what are, um, what are documents that can be provided? What kind of evidence? Um, on the PHA own units, now we're starting to do development. Um, we added that we could start, we may be able to provide project based vouchers on units that the city owns and that we're developing. And there's a lot around the project based voucher rules. Um, and then 
The homeless preference program, someone asked in the chat, um, what is HPP? This is a priority we give to persons who come on our wait list that are homeless. And so they'll get more points or be given preference to people who are not homeless. So this provides um, uh, an explanation of how that happens um, and how they come to us. So what we are um, saying is that it's often going to be through our how our homeless services um, that is done in the community and it's called coordinated entry and so there's some procedures around that and then we changed a chapter and again added new program information so as these two documents that go through the changes i'm going to share where that's at but again our admissions and continue occupancy it's a large document um, as you can see, 366 pages. It's a lot of rules, a lot of HUD regulations. And then on the housing choice voucher, uh, I don't have the plan open, but um, the work that Renee was talking about, the capital fund five-year action plan, that's posted on our website. You can see in detail by program year, this one says 2022, what what development and what type of work is being done and the estimated cost and finally the the whole presentation today is based on this annual agency plan this is the document i was telling you about that we have to send to hud and this is what everything we talked about today is covered in this document it's available for you to view and read and provide comments so going back to the presentation um, let me catch us up to where we were. So here are the, the cover pages for the two policy documents. You're welcome to comment on the changes that we talked about as well as long and on the cap, uh, the capital improvement program and on the agency plan. So where do you find these documents? The City of Tucson Housing Community Development has a website, um, and it's you can go to tucsonaz.gov, and if you do these backslash HCD um, and backslash plans, you can get to this document. I'm sorry, I'm going. My thing is a little sensitive here. So you'll find on this page where it says public comment draft documents. This is where you can look and read when, if and when the, these, plan, uh, these plans pass um, by our Board of Commissioners. They'll go in under the regular Public Housing Authority plans. But right now, they're all draft and they're all available for public comment. comment. So you'll see the agency plan, the ACOP, the summary of ACOP changes, the draft administrative plan, the summary of the administrative plan changes, and then the draft capital fund five-year action plan. So those documents are out there at this site. We'll make sure um, if you want a copy of these slides, we can provide them to you. Um, just email us and we'll make sure you get this um, slide presentation. Finally, where do you submit your comments? If you feel comfortable putting your comments into writing, we, those have to go into the plan. We have to share that with our Board of Commissioners. Um, we're going to the Board of Commissioners on this on April 5th. So get your comments in as soon as possible um, in the next couple of days so we can capture all your comments. You can email them to hcdadmin at tucsonaz.gov. If you're not comfortable writing them down, you're free to call this number and say, I want to submit my public comment on the agency plan and call this number 520-837-5322. So what happens now? We Today we held this meeting. We're going to go, um, I said April 5th. I think I'm right. I might have wrote it wrong on this slide. but. We're going to the Board of Commissioners if there is a public hearing there, and you are welcome to join that. Um, and if you want to know how to do that, you can email that same email or call us and say, I want to join the public hearing 
and I want to make a comment, we will make sure you know how to do that. If the board and commissioners, uh, which is mayor and council, uh, if they approve these documents, we will then submit them to HUD on April 15th. So that's the plan. And, and again, you, you being here has been very helpful um, to hear it. Now what we want to do is give you time to ask questions, to provide any feedback. So I'm going to ask Ernesto if he would lead us in that conversation, and I'm happy to answer questions, and our team is here to answer questions. So I'm thank you, Liz. Say, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, staff, for your presentation. Uh, to ask questions, if you are on a laptop or a desktop, at the bottom of your screen, you will see uh, to the right uh, a little icon that says reactions. You press that, and you'll see to raise your hand. If you are um, on a phone, you can uh, star nine to uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you. And then it's star six to unmute yourself. And you can also ask questions in the chat. And we do have some questions in the chat already and uh, get to them uh, right now. So there's two questions. Uh, what incentives are, uh, we giving landlords to accept Section 8 vouchers. Um, are we offering payments as in other housing authorities? And also, what are the new payment standards that went into effect on March 9th? Well, I'll start and I'm going to ask, I don't know if Cindy has the payment standards handy, but um, they, that those should be posted on our website. If not, we'll get them up there today. Uh -huh. But on our landlord incentive program, we have exhausted that. Um, we are looking to see how we might uh, identify new funding um, that to try to um, restart that again. Um, I think one of the things I want to just address, uh, based in on the the difficulty that people have on the Section Eight Housing Choice Voucher Program and identifying landlords. Um, some of you may have heard about the source of income ordinance that mayor and council have spoken and gave direction to city staff to get an ordinance um, completed. So we got the go ahead, but we have not gone back to mayor and council with that ordinance for their adoption. So that is still to come, hopefully soon, but I will say we've also been talking to Arizona Multi Housing Association, asking them Please have your members, your property managers, your owners work with our programs. We're really struggling. Uh, and I say we collectively as a community, there's uh, because of the market, there's very low vacancy rates. The rents are have been skyrocketing. We're having a lot of Section 8 tenants having to move because the landlords have raised the rents higher than our payment standards. So HUD did grant us a waiver about two weeks ago. I think it was around March 9th, um, to be able to increase up to 120% of the fair market rents, which is the maximum HUD allows. We have done that. It didn't go up as high as we would like. I think we are still seeing rents that are higher than our 120% of the fair market rents that, that Cindy talked about. So we still are a little bit priced out of the market and and again, landlords currently can still deny people who are voucher holders, but that could change once we get that ordinance adopted. Um, so that is um, not in place, but it, it may happen here in the next um, couple months. Um, so Cindy, do, can you speak to the payment standard question? Yes, okay, so... Um... The payment standards for the zero bedroom, I, I can um, share the document. I was trying to share the document into the chat, but the zero bedroom is 798. The one bedroom is 913. The two bedroom is 1,201. The three bedroom is 1,706. The four bedroom is $2,022. Five bedroom 
is 2324 and the sixth bedroom is 2628. And, and as you know, payment standards is in line with what HUD fair market rent. So those numbers are 120%. And that includes all housing costs. So if utilities was included in the rent, that would be the max a landlord that we could go into. Um, unless the, sometimes tenants have enough income, they can pay up to 40% of their income. So sometimes we can exceed uh, the, the rent, you know, has to be within the payment standards. If it's under, sometimes a tenant can pay a little bit more than, than that number. But please know that those, now that we're at 120%, we can't exceed that if the, the utilities are included. If utilities are not included, then there's a number that has to be backed out, which means the amount of rent the landlord can ask is gonna be lower than that amount if, the, if there's utilities that the tenant pays. No, that can get a little bit confusing. Someone has a specific question for their own that, so uh, please hold those questions and we can connect you to a caseworker, a housing specialist to help you with your individual questions, okay? Um, and then I just wanna address uh, Ernesto, the one question that talked about trying to get section eight landlords, uh, suggest that we get special complexes only for section eight. Um, it, that would be great. Um, at this point, we are willing to work with any landlord, but it is difficult right now. We have lost landlords instead of gained new landlords, but we can't find, we can't get a complex to only do section eight, unless the landlord says I'm willing to take section eight. So this is a voluntary program at this point and landlords can choose to work with our program and then they can change their mind to not work with our program. But it, as we have been working really hard to identify those landlords who will work with our program and help direct people to those landlords who have told us they'll work with us. So um, I will turn Thank it back to Ernesto. For more Thank you, questions. Liz. Uh, we'd like to call on Rhonda and then Heidi, uh, you can uh, follow Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda, your question. Hi, um, I have a couple questions. Um, one is, um, are you allowed to leave the state of Arizona with the Section 8 voucher after a year? Rhonda, yes. That's called portability. And um, that is a function of the program. And the only thing that HUD says is you just have to identify the housing authority you plan to go to and give that information to our office um, so that we can transfer the paperwork. And it has to be at the end of a lease. And the, or if the landlord's willing to let someone out of the lease. But the, the voucher is um, available in, in across the country, even Puerto Rico. Um, <laughs> so anyone can use their voucher as long as there's a housing authority that's willing to accept your voucher. And, and we're not allowed to deny them, but there could be instances where they'll say, we only will absorb. And so we have to be willing to give up. There's, there's some nuances to it. So when you identify the city and what the housing authority is, tell that to the caseworker. We'll talk to that housing authority, make sure that, that it can be done and that we do that in a timely basis. Okay, uh, my next question is um, this rent, rent increase thing. I think I, I pretty much got some clarity on it, but um, um, if the rent is still above your max, does that mean that the, as a tenant that I need to start looking to move? So, so let us talk to the landlord about that. I will mm -hmm. tell you that the answer to yes is probably, I mean, the answer to your question is probably yes. Um, what we do is if a landlord submits a rent increase um, and it's with it, let's say it's within our payment standards and, uh, uh, but it might be more than 40% of your income that you would pay towards rent. You have the option to pay as, to pay the increase, it might all fall on the tenant. So sometimes we, we need to talk to the tenant to say, you, can, you, can you do this? And do you want to pay this difference? The other thing is every time, whether it's a new unit or it's a renewal with a rent increase, we have to do a rent reasonableness test, which means we have to show that the rent is, that's being charged is the same as someone who's not on section eight. Um, and so we have to work with the landlord to ensure that that's happening. So, but unfortunately we've had more tenants than we'd like 
who have to move because the, the rent is higher than what the program can, can afford. Okay, so that leads me to my next question. Is there a place that you can go online or otherwise in your office that you could uh, uh, get updated information of landlords that are willing to take section eight? So Rhonda, that's the million dollar question. So what we, the, the website that we have partnered with to help us with that is called gosection8.com. I will say that the feedback is, it's very few if, if no units on that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not been the best resource at this time because of the way the market is. GhostSection8.com, I've been working with them in, in for many years in my career prior to coming to, to Tucson. It's a good website if landlords are participating and providing units. Right. So but that's the problem you're yeah. saying, is that right. you're not, you don't have the participation to fill the need. That's correct. So ways people are finding landlords today is word of mouth, um, you know, using different um, <laughs> online type search engines like that look for rentals. Um, and, and unfortunately, it's a, it's, it's a ton of work. If we do find anyone, if there's anyone on here who says, I've called high and low and I have no resources, talk to your caseworker. If we know of a landlord, we will share that information. But our, our information can change daily. Um, and, it, and often it's just based by phone calls um, and talking to landlords. So if you say, I need some help, if, do you know of any landlords? Ask, ask your housing specialist. And right now we don't have a signed housing specialist, but if you call and say, I'd like to speak to a housing specialist about how I might need some help finding a landlord, we will try to connect you to the right people. But it's uh, often our information is as limited as, as yours, but okay. it is a challenge today. Um, sometimes working real, with real estate agents, sometimes they have access mm -hmm. to rentals. Um, and if they know you have Section 8, not all real estate agents do that, but some might if you reach out to a real estate agent for help. And that's a simple phone call right there. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Rhonda. Okay. We'll move on uh, to Heidi. Uh, on Hi there. Hi. I, I just want to thank you for doing this. Um, I do have a Section 8 voucher. And, um, I, you know, I've had a little bit of problems over on and off, but uh, I'll just tell you a slight amount about my situation right now is that um, I put my paperwork in the box outside the building and it was lost. And so I just, you know, I finally called you guys um, yesterday, I guess. <laughs> and my rent usually goes up on the first. Um, so the person said, you're not accepting paperwork inside the building that I should still put it in the box outside. And she suggested that I put my paperwork on top of the box and take a picture of it to show that I actually submitted it. And that seemed kind of, you know, I, I'm not going to do that. I decided to um, come in during the, the hours that you have available for walk-ins. But, um, but then I was also, uh, and I'm glad to hear about the new um, payment standard because my rent is 500 and my, my landlord now has listed an apartment exactly like mine for 895 a month uh, you know so i mean right now my my rent is 500 so I, yeah i was afraid i was gonna have to move but i mean hopefully <laughs> you're not gonna raise it that much um what was my other question oh have you ever thought about doing um shared housing vouchers like roommates because i know um i looked at two moving to sacramento and they they started doing that like pe people two people with vouchers move in together so I'm gonna I'm gonna bat that one to Cindy because um, I HUD does provide us some available models and I'm wondering if that if we have that in our admin plan. We do have shared housing if that's what you're talking about. Um, and so yes, it is in the admin plan. And so if you find a place where a landlord is willing to rent to you, you can utilize your voucher. Um, we do have a section in the admin plan, and there is a CFR on um, Code of Federal Regulation um, for shared housing. So when we're determining the rent and utilities, there could be a prorated amount. 
it's the higher of the, I mean, I'm sorry, the lower of the payment standard or the prorated amount that you figure out when you're doing shared housing. So yes, that is a possibility. And what we can do is in the administrative plan, Heidi, we can tell you where that's at. It doesn't mean it has to be two voucher holders. It means a landlord that probably has a roommate situation and, mm -hmm. and one of the rooms would be rented to someone with a voucher. So you don't have to find another voucher holder to, to do it with you. Oh yeah, there's a lot of those um, uh, university housing things that, you know, maybe that would work. I don't know <laughs> if I'd want to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Heidi. Let me go to the chat and then I'll go back to our uh, online. A question, how long do we have to wait for our voucher amount to be raised after we submit newborn baby documents? So I, I'm gonna try and then Cindy, you uh, correct me. So typically when someone reports a new addition to the family, you're already in a certain bedroom size. So we don't change that unless you are, you are under, let's, I'll use an example. I have a two bedroom voucher um, and it's me and my 10 year old son. I have a child. That does not necessarily mean I get a three bedroom. If I'm in a three bedroom that was, but I really have a, a two bedroom like family and, and the landlord raises the rent, it could be because of the family composition, we could change that to a three bedroom voucher, but each situation is very different. So our admin plan talks about occupancy standards. So how many people per bedroom is, is what determines the voucher size. So if you have a child, it does not necessarily mean you're gonna have a change of a voucher size, but it, it could mean that at the end of your lease and you wanna move, um, depending on the family composition, if you're eligible for a higher voucher amount, then you have the choice to move at that time. Um, Cindy, would you add or change anything I said, said there? No, I, that is correct. Mm -hmm. I, I have to tell you guys, I used to be a housing specialist years ago, but it's so, I still think I know the, the rules, but sometimes I forget. So I always check with the experts. Thank you, Liz. Uh, a person uh, with SR initials, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, how, how is everyone today? We're well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, great. Um, well, actually, um, my I'm an authorized representative for a family um, that has um, a voucher here in the city of Tucson. And um, their scenario actually is a combination of two that you've already discussed. Um, one pertaining to Heidi when, uh, you know, about documents and them being sent and not being properly processed and scanned. And um, the other portion to the scenario is just the fact of um, about um, occupancy and determining eligibility. Um, so essentially, um, their scenario um, was that they submitted their application or recertification timely. And in there, they had uh, mentioned about adding uh, additional household um, member to um, their household, um, which is a minor, in which um, they were going through the courts in order to get uh, guardianship awarded to them. And so, um, they never received um, any type of communication from a Section 8 or the City of Tucson stating that um, the information was received, um, whether or not if it was approved or denied, or whether or not if they were missing any further documents. And so um, they went ahead and um, did receive their two-bedroom voucher um, or the voucher. And um, when they went to go look um, for a place because they, they on the paper it had that it, it was a three bedroom that they were eligible for. But when they actually looked at the voucher, they saw it was a two bedroom. So they addressed the situation with the city of Tucson housing and came down. And, you know, the, the response that they received was just outstanding. Um, the family was accused of fraud. And um, they basically were told that um, they will have to wait until their annual recertification 
um, to make those changes. Um, the family was wanting to go ahead and um, file an informal hearing, request an informal hearing or file an appeal. However, the representative told them that option wasn't available to them. And so um, in addition to those two issues about the, you know, the handling of paperwork and it not being properly entered and documented and processed, as well as, you know, just the um, lack of customer service with, you know, holding that family accountable for an error that they did not make and them being penalized for um, the city of Tucson not failing to uphold their part of the deal. And that's notify the family of anything so that they will be have the time to either present documentation or whatever the case, you know, it's also that customer service that they receive, um, you know, just being accused of fraud and, you know, for that representative to expect for that family to present information when one, it wasn't formally requested. And then, you know, two, it's no space on the application to give that information. You know, why would they automatically default to a negative connotation for that family? And that's just really unfair. You know, I participated yeah. if on I this. Can, if uh -huh. I can. Um, so I, you know, I always have, you know, been doing this work in Section 8 for many years. We make a lot of mistakes. Um, it's not excusable. Um, we should not be losing paperwork. Um, but I will say, and, and, and treatment of, and customer service and treatment of our clients, it, for me, is extremely important. So when I hear that people are, have been not treated to the level that we want, I can tell you I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Um, so what we'll do is I love to take personal situations. I'd prefer if you guys could submit that in writing. You can either submit it to Terry Galligan, to Cindy Nunes, or to me, um, Liz Morales, and we can address those individual issues. Um, and, and hopefully we find out that those issues are not the norm, but they are exceptions. And because I will tell you, we hold all our staff to very high expectations on how to treat staff and how to handle paperwork. So you present a situation that's not not something I you know, want to hear. And, and what I want to do is to correct it right away. So if you don't mind emailing us um, that situation or having that family put it into writing, we can address that and we can correct that. Um, and, and, and maybe the correction or the resolution isn't what the family wants, but at least we can explain it in a way that's respectful and, and explains the rules and the policies. So if you don't mind um, making sure you get our emails and share that information and, and the details um, to keep that family's confidentiality. Um, but please know we, we can easily address that issue and make sure that doesn't happen again. Yes, ma'am. And in terms of rectifying the situation, um, that will also be assessed as well. Is that correct? That's, that's the goal. Again, whether or not they can move now or, if, or later, we'll, we'll, we'll determine that. Well, no, they, they don't even have a place. They just only have their voucher. Okay. So let's so. talk. Yeah, let's talk offline. And, and um, between Cindy and Norma, we'll make sure you get that gets rectified and addressed. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you very much. And you said the emails are in the chat. Yes, yeah, so I'll just make have, sure. Yeah. I put them in. Awesome. Thank you thank all you. very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Someone uh, named iPhone Kathy. I love that. iPhone Kathy. Your question. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, so I think one of my questions already got answered with the, if our vouchers were going to get raised and, but so do I do, do we come to the office to get a new, uh, packet or can we still use our old ones? So you're talking about the payment standards, the rents. So the yeah. voucher forms should be the same. They, those don't need to be updated. What what the difference is when they, the landlord requests a rent, then we'll determine if the rent it fits the program parameters when you submit, when you find a place you want to rent. 
Right. Well, for right now, I thought my that I thought my it was eight thirty seven was what my standard was for a one bedroom. Okay. And yeah, and, and again, like you guys are well aware of the situation that hardly any landlords, at least on the east side, because I wanted to stay by my mother, and uh, but a lot of them are not. Even the ten fifty apartments, mm-hmm. I was on their waiting list, and then their owners are like, "Well, we're not going to accept Section Eight anymore." And I know you guys are trying to get landlords to accept it. And it's just, it's just really crazy out there right now. Yeah. And I'm so sorry about that. I am going to ask Cindy um, for a response on to, if people want to know what the, if it's changed from 837 to what that number is, what, how do you want them to ask that question, Cindy? So she was on a one bedroom payment standard. So that went up to eight, I'm sorry, 913. All right, cool. Yeah, I wrote that down. I just wanted to make sure that that's correct. And then also for the GoSection8.com website, I've actually been on there as well. And it's either maybe some of them are, I don't know who updates these websites or if they do, but I know I've had some issues on there too. I've tried to call a few and either they, they're, yeah, just a lot of people are not accepting Section 8 at this time is what they keep telling us or else they're not accept it at all anymore the other thing i forgot to mention you know there's less and less a lot of people who were mom and pops during the pandemic i've heard from from the tucson association of realtors and ama a lot of a lot of people sold their homes or sold their units that they owned and were renting but still there may be new people out there that are now wanting to be landlords and maybe they're not you know um you know, been in this business long, who are willing to take the voucher. So Craigslist is something you have to be careful of, but yeah, I won't. That, but I will say Craigslist is where I've, I've been really successful for some tenants. Um, if, if you, as long as you determine they're legitimate and they really do own the unit, um, but mom and pops, landlords is the term, private owners who are wanting to rent their units. Um, some, some of them are condos, you know, townhomes. Those are great ones. If you can just say here, this is who I am, uh, you know, yes, section eight, but it's easy. So someone, I think it was Shanna uh, talked about what landlords are saying about payments and turnaround. You know, I, I, I joke, that's an old statement. If someone's saying that they haven't worked with our program for at least two years, um, we made some significant improvements in our processes. Landlords are getting uh, that initial payment the first time someone moves into the unit, it used to take a long time to get paid or there might be issues. Now we're paying those within about 30 to 40 days. Um, and so that turnaround, our inspections are happening very, very quickly. So if a landlord says, I stopped working because you know they, they were overdue with their payments, that, that we've been able to address that and that's no longer an issue. In fact, all the landlords that work with us now, the feedback is it's, it's running very well. Um, but again, we have to get them to work with us. That's the, the deal. So hopefully right. that answers. Uh, thank you, iPhone Kathy. Uh, let me go to the chat. Um, this may have been addressed, but I don't think so. But I'll ask it anyway. Could you please elaborate on the, oops, wrong one. <laughs> if you qualify for a two bedroom, but find a three bedroom for the price of two, can you potentially get the three? I, I'm going to ask Cindy to answer that question. I believe that's an A OK thing to do, but I want to. A OK. A OK. Just remember that you, um, the utility allowance will be of a two bedroom as well. It's for the voucher. Um, so that's the allowance that you would get. Okay, just, thank you. Ernesto, if I can, I would love, um, oh, I, I think Heidi had a, still had a question. Did you still have a question, Heidi? Oh, I, yeah. I just want to make a comment about losing the paperwork. Um, I just don't know. I wonder where it went because I've been the um, victim of identity theft before. Mm-hmm. Someone, um, claimed unemployment for the pandemic and got $15,000 in my name. So, and also having to put your stuff in the, in the lockbox outside a building is just, you know, 
it's not because I already put it in in December and then I didn't find out until I called it yesterday that they never got it. Yeah. So Heidi, I, I, I'm one of those that I don't believe we lose paperwork. I think paper gets misfiled. Um, so we can definitely try to do another uh, search for that. You know, I, I do think we need to update our processes where we want to also try to get to a point where things are more electronic. If at some point we can do that with landlords where they can submit it for you. So we're, we're talking to our vendor and trying to figure out ways so that we don't have to deal with lost paperwork. But often what happens is a paperwork gets put in the wrong place and then we find it months later. Um, and that's more typical because once it's, it's that bin is very secure and then we bring that into the building and it doesn't go anywhere. We're No one's allowed to leave with any paperwork. So that's more often when we say lost, I don't like that word lost. We, we typically have failed you in the sense of not making sure the paperwork got to the right place. So, but again, on individual situations, give us a chance. Maybe we can find that um, and, uh, and email us your situation um, and we'll look into it. Yeah, and I, I, I made copies of everything, so I'm going to bring it tomorrow. Okay. And I really like the idea of having an online portal. Yeah. It would be awesome. So, thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, Liz, could you go over again the, uh, the, the plan to uh, help uh, with rising uh, rents uh, with the re uh, increase in the threshold uh, with the AMI? Yeah, so you know right now the rents are at the max that we can go that hud allows us to so those are the 120 percent of the area uh, of the fair market rents um we will continue to try to find ways um hopefully hud will give us um higher rents october is when they publish their their fair market rents so that's the next time we'll know what that is um, and so we'll continue to work on that. We, um, right now there's, uh, most of you probably know, there's no ability to do, uh, from the state perspective to do any kind of rent control to say, no, you can't raise rents on people. That's not something as a city that we can do. Um, but we are working with Arizona Multi-Housing Association to say, how can you help help bring your members, your landlords back to our program. And so right now, one of the things we're doing is uh, making, having good processes. So talking about the submission of paperwork to the approval and inspection, we told them, we think we can get from the time the paperwork is submitted, if it's all complete and everything is, uh, the landlords provide us everything we need, we can get to that inspection date within around seven days, business days, okay? Seven business days. So we, that's the, the amount of time I think is reasonable. Um, if there's delays, it might be because we had to go back to the landlord to say, we need this document, we need that document. Because as a city, every public housing authority has to ensure that it is truly the owner of the property, that we have the right tax information, and that we have all the unit information for us to be able to, to do that. So sometimes that delay is going back and forth with the landlord. Um, the inspections are happening with, a, you know, scheduling that within two, three days. So seven business days is what you can expect if the packet that is submitted is complete. If it takes longer, it's because there's some back and forth. So that, and then once it passes inspection, the day after our participant can move into that unit. And then we ask the landlord for an executed lease we email them the contract that's between the housing authority and the landlord. And by the time we get that submitted back to us, um, signed the contract, our payment usually will be sent out in le about less than 30 days. We have two payment, two check runs a month. So depending on when that contract comes back to us, is we'll, we'll, the next pay period is, uh, the next check run is when we pay landlords. So again, I hope that helps um, the idea of what that time frame is. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I have a question from OnePlus Nord. You can unmute yourself. You're muted, OnePlus. Okay. OnePlus. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. 
Um, one plus, we can't hear you. <laughs> okay, she's connecting. Dun 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 dun. While we're, we're waiting for we're waiting. her, um, I mm -hmm. do want to know: Is there anyone on this call that is a public housing resident? If if you are, I would. Uh, I just wanted to get a sense of. I'm glad we've had a good number of people on Section Eight. Is there any? Is there anyone here that's a public housing resident, meaning in our one of the units we own? I'm confused <laughs> as to what that is. Yeah, so we own property, and so the programs that Selene has. So it's oh. not a voucher; it's oh, rent. No. Uh, but the 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 operator and landlord is our staff, city staff. So I think I saw one hand go up. Is that you, Justine? Yeah. I I am just I know I'm on Section Eight housing. Yeah. Right. So sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Liz, Mike's here. Oh, Mike. Oh, there you are, your yellow sweatshirt. I should know that's you. <laughs> Good. So then one plus is still connecting to us. Yeah, she's still connecting. Yeah. And who do you talk to about the FSS program, the Family self sufficient oh, I'm glad you asked about that. I was thinking when we were talking about it earlier, we needed to do a little commercial. The Family self sufficiency <laughs> program is an excellent program um, and for people who are starting at little to no income and want to work your way up and as you work your way up and have increases in your rent, there's a, 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 a certain amount that goes into an escrow account and some people, a lot of people when they graduate the program it's typically a five year program some people graduate a lot sooner, they get those funds either for down payment or to maybe for education to buy a car whatever the needs are. Um, but if you're interested in the family self-sufficiency program, uh, Selene or Sydney, who, who, or oh, I'm sorry, Norma, who would they contact? Uh, they could contact myself and I'll get it to our uh, FSS staff. Okay. And I'll have Cindy put in my uh, email address. Okay. It'll be in the chat box. Norma Peterson is the contact. Norma Peterson. Hi. Can you hear me? Is this one plus Nord? Yes, hi. Hi. You know, sorry, I just uh, I I kind of joined the meeting late. I just got off of work. Um, I I have no idea what's going on. So, so I I jumped in where they said that the voucher is going to change the amount. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so we did have an increase as of March 9th. Um, and so we now have a higher payment standard. It's up to 120% of the fair market rents. Um, it's, if, you, if you have access to the chat, um, can we add that in there again? I, sometimes Norma, people Norma just add add that don't get to see that. So we'll, we'll, it's also going to be posted on our website. And Norma did add it in there. Yeah, we'll have to re-add it for new people that join in. They won't be able to see it. Mm. I see it. I see it. I'll repost. I'll get the okay, I don't know if I don't know if you guys can still hear me. I don't know if I'm on mute. Yeah, yeah, so. we can still hear you. Did you have a question? No, I was just making sure. Um I, I didn't get the email uh the website on that so I can get it down real quick. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. So what we'll do is um, are you able to see the, the chat function? The chat function? Uh, I don't think so, no. I really don't know what I'm doing. That's okay. <laughs> this is my first time. Do me a favor. We're going to um, write this email down and, and we'll get it to you, okay? It's ACD admin. ACD admin? By HCD, like Housing Community Development, the word admin, okay. all one word, HCD admin, A D M I N, at tucsonaz.gov. That's tucsonaz.gov. And just say, I would like to get the payment standards. We'll get it to you. Payment standards. And uh, is my landlord aware of it? Um, 
So the, the, what happens is it's based on new updates, so new contracts, that's when it applies. It doesn't mean every landlord now gets an increase. It means when we do new contracts, it'll apply. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we have a comment here from the chat. Uh, uh, the comment is, I live in public housing and was approved for reasonable accommodation to move to a safer location, but haven't heard anything in almost two years. I've tried calling, but the only number I have turns out to be Section 8, and I'm told they can't help me. How can I make sure that I'm still on the wait list? So I'm going to ask Selena if she'd like to answer that. What I'll do is I'll put my email and my direct phone number so you can contact me. That way we're not sharing your information, your personal information. Uh, are you able to view the sh chat? Well, she did a chat. It's oh, a question off the chat. Uh -huh. Okay, then I'll go ahead and put it on there. Uh... So Beth, I'll just jump into the one yeah. asking about the ordinance. It, yes. has, it has a very good chance of passing pretty much unanimous from mayor and council. Um, mm -hmm. And so the ordinance would say that um, it, it briefly that if, as long, if someone meets the standards of tenancy, meaning that the landlord has determined someone is eligible to rent their unit that and they have a source of income that uh, like a voucher or uh, some other sub subsidy rental assistance, that person can't be denied. A person can be denied is if they don't meet the, the tenancy requirements or the rent amount, they can deny. But if the ordinance passes, they can't deny, deny solely on the reason of a rental assistance program like the voucher. Thank you, Liz. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. Oh, wait a minute. Um, May I yes, question? Yes. yes. Um, so I, the one apartment that I did apply for, I got turned away because I didn't make three times the income. So will there be something, is that part of like what this ordinance is, is that you can't do that or? So good question. I've thought about that too. Um, I probably would have, so my feeling is they may still have that requirement in there. I, I you know, um, the source of income just talks about what the source is, but if they have a certain level of income they want to see, I think that's outside of the ordinance is my feeling. So, but I know a lot of people don't meet that requirement, even people who have a, a good amount of income, just the way the rents are. So it's definitely a hard, high threshold to meet. Yeah, because um, been turned away. Yeah. So I won't apply anymore because I. <laughs> so, so Neto, uh, if you mm -hmm. don't mind, um, I do have a hard stop at three thirty, but I, you know, I'm so appreciative of the questions and everyone attending, um, and I just wanted to make sure that this doesn't mean you don't can't ask more questions. We just can't ask for them to send it or call us, right? Right. Thank you, Liz. So uh, thank you, Liz, but uh, others, if you wanna stay on, um, we'll have some staff to stay on for a few minutes longer if you have any additional questions or comments. Also, uh, you can write us directly. Uh, my email address is Ernesto, E-R-N-E-S-T-O dot Portillo, P-O-R-T-I-L-L-O at tucsonaz.gov. And uh, you can mail, email anyone else using the tucsonaz.gov uh address uh let's see someone has a comment about with the rapidly changing market how is this going to affect the rent reasonableness reasonableness of units comparing rents from even six months ago is an area that could be problematic well we could write a long story about that but um uh i don't know terry do you want to take a stab at that well, we are restricted by HUD and how often we can uh, raise our rents. 
Mm-hmm. And it usually comes out once a year. HUD comes out with their rent uh, amounts that we can charge. And then we can go, like right now we're at our, our maximum, we can go up to 120% of that. We anticipate that HUD will probably come out with some new um, rent uh, amounts. Usually they come out in um, April. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Cindy, is it usually April or is it more, I'm thinking, I might be thinking of the home fund program. It's October. It? Yeah, I'm, I apologize. I was thinking of, of uh, the home ownership home program. So we won't get any, probably any raising of any rents until HUD comes out with their guidelines in October. Okay, thank you, Terry. Uh, Shannon, did you have another question? Your hand is up, I see on... I do, thank you. Thank so you, I'm not, <laughs> you're welcome. I'm not entirely sure which program I'm on, um, just because when I came in, it was, I was homeless, but it was from um, like La Frontera. So my, my rental agreement, it's one of their properties, I guess. So my rental agreement, it does say section eight, but I never received a voucher or anything like that. So I'm not hundred percent sure what the program is that I'm on. Yeah, you might be in the continuum of care program, which is uh, not a section eight uh, voucher. It's a specific program that uh, partner agencies like La Frontera and Primavera Foundation are part of. So that's most like what you're participating in. But it is acts very similar and it's pretty much the same as a Section 8 voucher. Okay, and does that make me open to apply for Section 8 or not at all? No, you definitely could apply. We actually encourage people that are using the continuum of care type of voucher or, or program, it's not really a voucher, to apply for Section 8. That would be the ideal situation. Okay, and would I go through my caseworker for that, the caseworker over the apartments that I'm in? I would recommend, yes, that you start with the caseworker like the, at La Frontera. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome. Rhonda, did you have another question? You're muted. Can't hear you, Rhonda. Unmuted. Yeah, there sorry. You. That's all right. <laughs> um, uh, what was I going to ask? Oh, what does that mean for rep people that are on rapid rehousing? Are they uh, under, they're not Section 8, right? They're under a different umbrella with the city? Yeah, there's various agencies that have uh, what we call rapid rehousing. Those programs are typically six months up to 24 months. Oh. And the idea is that uh, you'd be in a situation where after six months, you'd be able to take over and pay 100% of your own rent. Oh, uh, but 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 due to you know your ability, it could last up to two years, possibly. There are extensions that are available for rapid rehousing. There's a lot of different rapid rehousing programs right now, so it just varies from program to program. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't really affect me, but somebody else I know. I just thought I'd ask for them. Sure thing. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Uh see anyone else i don't see anything else anyone else right now with a hand up um if not uh like to question Sorry. Yes, I, do, you, ahead, do you have Mark. any idea when the wait list will reopen for section eight because i have i I've, it hasn't been open for a long time i don't think yeah. uh we're looking at a possibility of uh, sometime this summer um oh. which could mean july um we have, uh, we're working with uh, our uh, software company that uh, needs to help us uh, come up with how we open that up because it'll be a, a process that people will be able to apply online. So the best case scenario would probably be July. Okay. And then will it be open more than a couple days? Because <laughs> in the past, it was only open a week. Yeah, it's not going to be open very long. We will have plenty of uh, advertising. It'll okay. be on. You know, with Ernesto and his his uh, ability to get the word out, the public will be well informed of what the dates are, but it won't be open for very long. You're correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, iPhone has a question. 
Oh, hi, I'm Sue. How are you? Hi, Sue. Thank you. Well. Yes. Yes, I'm interested in being connected to the resident advisory board. I just heard about that the last few weeks. And um, as a renter for HUD, I wasn't, I, I didn't know much about this. Maybe the programs only existed for the last few years. So if anyone can give me a number to reach out to the different um, representatives for the wards, I would, I would love that. That would be me. You can, uh, you're interested in joining our resident advisory board. We just had our first meeting a couple of weeks ago. We are hmm. looking for uh, uh, folks that want to uh, help us with these plans that you see um, that we're talking about today. So um, you can call me. Um, I'll put my number in the chat. Um, but my phone number is 837 5006 if you're interested in joining our resident advisory board. Yes, I am interested. Liz Morales has already asked me to do so, but I have to see who I'm working with. And I know it's, it's a bold statement, but I really would be interested in who I work with and, and I can uh, flourish more. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I thank you for your question, which brings up uh, uh, a, a nice suggestion on my part. Uh, you're active in this meeting, continue your, your active role in, in the public in advocating for more affordable and public housing. Talk to your friends, your family members, talk to your political representatives about the importance of the subject. Shannon, you had uh, another question, comment? I did have one more. Um, I had updated a few, several years ago, I was on the wait list for section eight and I had updated my information and I waited about a year and a half to contact again because they normally tell us not to contact um, the actual office to see where we're at on the wait list because they can't see. Um, so I waited about a year and a half because I know the wait list was really long. It was about five years was the estimate. I called them and they said that I was up that they reached out and they never got a hold of me. Well, it turned out my contact information wasn't correctly updated. So I missed out on that. Um, how can I, in the future, make sure that doesn't happen again without bugging them? Because I know you guys are busy also. Well, like I said, there's an opportunity coming up now that our, we're reopening the wait list. And now that we have this, uh, uh, portal and the software that we were able to track who applied and when. We're hoping that, that that'll be a customer service improvement going forward. So, yeah, okay. that has been a weakness in the past of our, you know, and then, like you say, we have so many people and so few vouchers. Um, but uh, this time around, we're hoping that the system will work better. Okay. And then, with me being in the program I'm in, I wouldn't be one of top priority is what I'm asking. Would that be accurate? Well, I, th I think I encourage you if, if you're not on the wait list to get on the wait list. So, you know, it's, it's really, we're doing a lottery system. So you, you know, we'll, what we'll do is if we get 5,000 applicants or 10,000, we'll do a lottery system and there's, uh, that's how we're going to do it. So it's fair across the board. Okay. Thank you very much. You guys, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Shannon, for, for participating. SR, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I think you have a new question. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, regarding an issue where um, there, okay, so Section 8 acknowledged that um, the family had to, had, well, the it's pretty much well a similar situation where um, the apartment community determined they no longer wanted to accept Section 8. So they gave the family a 60-day notice. Um, they had to be out the, the unit by February the 28th. So family was out of the unit. Um, however, Section 8 paid um, that amount for the month of March. Um, on March 22nd, um, the property group went ahead and, and, and alleged that the family was still staying in the unit and that they owed the difference amount 
you know, sticking to as if the contract was still in effect from what was under Section 8, under the HAP. And so, you know, how the, would a situation like that be addressed? Like, why wasn't it, you know, reconciled that the property shouldn't have not gotten that rent for the month of March, um, despite that both parties knew that that family was going to be out that unit on February the 28th? Yeah, I mean, these circumstances you're bringing up are very specific. I, I would encourage you to get in touch with our staff and we can we can research this. But, um, you know, I, I can't answer in generalizations, but but we'd be glad to do some research and find out what happened with this. So um, you can okay. get in touch with me or Cindy um, or Norma. OK, no problem. Thank you again. Thank you. From the chat, uh, Terry uh, and, and Steph, uh, question, is there any place where we can find out about upcoming construction or availability for Section 42 buildings that may accept Section 8 vouchers? Yeah, that uh, probably refers to the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we do track that here at the city. We do know of some projects that are online. There's one um, actually really near the Tucson house. Right. So uh, yes, if you're interested in that, you can contact me and we can uh, um, update you uh, periodically. And when we know when a, uh, a new low income housing tax project is going to open. Thank you, Terry. Uh, another question from the chat. We are four people in two groups. A newborn baby, is a newborn baby eligible for the third bedroom as we are going to be five people now? I'll let uh, Cindy answer that one. Okay, so that's our occupancy standards. And so um, it does indicate that five to six people would get a three bedroom, um, but we would have to look again, it's kind of specific. Um, we would have to look at age and gender to determine if three bedroom is enough. So if, you know. Yeah, that's okay. another one of those very specific questions. Right. That is, it definitely has the factor of age and gender um, would have to be taken into consideration, but we'd be glad to look at that. So please reach out to Cindy or myself and we'll, we'll look into that for you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Terry. Um, Rhonda, your hand is still up, but I think you've asked your questions. Oh, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you guys all for organizing this and putting this together because it's really helpful to us. Um, to have a place that we can go to, to ask questions without feel like we're impeding on somebody's workload. Um, my other last question um, was, is there any way for us to know a little bit ahead of time when the, the waiting list will open up or is it just something you should check periodically? No, we'll definitely um, have lots of uh, information out there. This is something that across the community, radio, TV stations. Okay very interested in. You can follow us on our website. I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. That's another way you can get that information with plenty of notice. Okay. Well, thanks, you guys. I really appreciate everything. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Hannah, still up for iPhone. iPhone, did you uh, have another question or did you already ask your question? Are you talking about me? Uh, yes. yes, your hand is up. I don't know if you took it down. Oh, gosh, I'm such a slow typist. Uh, no, that's all right. You got to see I, me. I was, I was trying to say that uh, I understand with the COVID, the nutrition program, families were rewarded, like in mine, for two children, $457 extra. So my perspective is because the race in rent and there are people that said there's no way that we can get things to change. But if things were changed because of COVID and with the food stamp program, there's gotta be some way to where we can stop the investors from charging, a, I swear to God, additional 200 in six months for a two bedroom, three bedroom. And, and in my property, there, charging me additional 225 
So I could have come up with additional 400. And thank God to Liz, Terry, Cindy, and CJ Boyd, who listened to my story and helped me out. There are people that go out of their way to solve issues, but there's too many people. So I thank you guys for focusing on me because I would like to give back and help others. And I'll participate in City of Tucson, volunteering, anything um, to give time back to you guys. I appreciate you saying that. Um, the one thing I have to say is that the City of Tucson is restricted and we're not allowed to uh, implement any ordinances about um, rent control. You know, some places, some cities in, across the country you know, have limitations. You can't increase the rent by more than 10% per year. Unfortunately, our, our state legislature won't let us do that. But we uh, you know, are trying to change that because uh, I think across the entire state, people are recognizing that rents are going up faster than people's income. Yes, and I was a participant in 2018 with the um, O Housing First. Okay. Uh, so I don't know what they have done in the city to quickly house homeless people. And I heard you that you're the person to reach out to. And there are many, many programs for that rapid housing, but all's great. And I'm here listening to wonderful people give knowledge to us but as a person that don't go out much how can i help others if i don't know the right answer like uh i would love to go to a website and print that out and distribute to the 176 units that i live to help other people that were evicted or kicked out well i would say like uh right now we're putting in our chat our our, uh, how to sign up for our newsletter, how to stay in touch with So it could be, a, you know, a back and forth. If any of you on this call, remaining on this call, have suggestions or would like, uh, like to help us out, um, please feel free to reach out to us. And we learn every time we talk to the public in these type of meetings, we learn a lot also. So we don't have all the answers. We don't have all the connections, but feel free to reach out to us anytime and we, we can work together. Sure, I, I will send it quickly because I might take too long to get my word out. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. um, we're at about 15 minutes to the hour. Uh, our scheduled time to end is at four o'clock. I don't see any more questions uh, or hands up. Um, on In the chat, uh, we, uh, Rachel, uh, my colleague, put in the uh, link to uh, for our monthly newsletter. If you don't, uh, please uh, sign up for it. Um, and oh, uh, the, the guy with the sweater, Mike. Hey, hey, no, no, I just want to let you know there is a, a question in chat. Is there? Well, uh, my old eyes don't didn't see it. Would you want to go ahead and ask it? <laughs> Why, sure. <clears throat> okay. um, the question is, if I live in Section 8 and I want to move to another house in Tucson, can I move during any time or do I have to wait until my lease is finished? Yeah, I'll let Cindy answer this one. I, I think I know the answer, but I don't want to bot it. Go ahead, Cindy. So for an initial lease term, you do need to remain in your unit for the 12 months. If it's a renewal, you can move. Um, you just need to give notice, proper notice and submit that notice to Section 8. You and the landlord um, have to agree on that and then submit it to us so that we can prepare a voucher so you can move to another unit. Okay, thank you. Mike, did I miss any other questions in the chat? <laughs> uh, let me check, let's see. I know, I believe that was the last one. Uh, let me introduce you to Mike Edmonds. He is... Uh, a Tucson uh, superhero. He's a residence council. He is an ambassador for Ward 3, as well as for housing and community development. Mike does it all. And we uh, are very appreciative of his efforts in working with us on housing issues. Well, as was, as was uh, mentioned a little earlier, you know, I'm very thankful for what I have. And <laughs> I've tried to give back and, uh, and help others, basically. And, uh, 
that's what I've been, that's what I've been after. I see, well, you, you've heard me say it, a lot of opportunities and possibilities. So I'm, I'm, I'm pushing for them all. Thank you. And so on that note, I guess, so we can uh, finish here. Uh, again, hey, Matt, see, yes. Sorry. No, um, no. Go ahead, Rachel. It looks like um, somebody else did put a question in the chat asking okay. if uh, we could post the new voucher amount in the chat, if that's possible. The um, voucher uh, payment standards have been posted in the, the chat. Yeah, they're, they're in there. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah, there's again, there's a lot of information in the chat. This recording uh, will be available. Uh, again, please contact us for any additional information or uh, recording the, the, the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we're here to help you, to serve you. Uh, and again, thank you so much for your participation in this uh, meeting of the annual action plan for the Public Housing Authority. And let's see. One more question, that's it. All right, thank you again, everyone. And uh, be strong, be safe, be healthy, and advocate for public housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oops, sorry.